introduce you to Dr. Stephen Greer. Again, when I first saw the, um, the Disclosure Project and how he paraded all these people up there on the stage to tell their, their genuine story, and they swore, they all swore that they would stand and testify before Congress under penalty of prison if they lied. They would stand and tell this story to Congress. So again, I thought he was like, oh, he's going to be the good guy, man. He's going he's to expose this whole thing for what it is. And I'm going to start watching him. Well, I did. I started watching him. And he's put out several documentary films over the last 10 years. And at, over that time, I've come to recognize the kind of man that he really is. He's not this scientist who is trying to find scientific evidence, fact, proof that the alien world exists, the phenomenon is real, and that it represents a serious transformation of the entire earth. But what he really is, is a channeling, oh, I don't want to be harsh in what I call him. The guy's just, he's, he's gone around the bend a little bit. He has been in contact, I'd say he's close, getting up close to 70 years old. He has been in contact with these visitors ever since he was about 18 years old in college, going to medical school. He's a doctor for a reason. He was an ER doctor, head of the ER department in the hospital that he worked in. So this guy's got some smarts, he's got some brains. But, and when I say he's been in contact with them, take a look at the picture. You recognize it? That's yoga. He's reciting his mantra. He's the director of C SETI, the Center for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, leader of the Disclosure Project, and he's developed an additional close encounter level that he calls close encounter of the fifth kind. Human initiated contact through meditation and visualization, this will allow ET to hear their broadcast and bring about contact. Notice their little pop-up there on the page says, welcome to ET, let's talk. We're partnering with our ET friends to create Earth's golden age. He's a new ager. He's wrapped it up in a different package but he's a new ager through and through. He meditates, which means he empties his mind, which in reality terms means that he's opened up a locked door to the core of his, of his being, his, his mind, his intelligence. He's opened up the door not to allow himself out, but to allow spirits in. And he claims that he has the ability to go into a meditative state almost as quick as a snap. And he claims, and I think some of his claims are probably true, he claims that he has the ability to call down an extraterrestrial craft and its occupants just about any time he wants. And according to him, he's tested it several times, and it works just about every time. Here's what his website says. Our ET Let's Talk community's mission is to remain in the forefront of proactive and interactive communication with advanced and benevolent star civilizations visiting our planet. A major part of that mission is to teach the world that every day people can make safe and loving contact. As representatives of the larger human family, we recognize that our Earth is in a challenging and exciting period, look at that, of transfiguration. You know what that means? Changing its figure, its form, into a golden age of peace, prosperity, freedom, justice, healing, and spiritual growth. During this critical time, our community seeks to do its part to aid the Earth's transfiguration by, listen to this, by co-creating the what? the new world with our star friends. Listen, he just announced to you that he is working with our enemies, the enemies of the gospel, seducing spirits, that he is working with them 
to bring about a new world order. Notice I took the order and slid it over here just a little bit and didn't say it with the new world. What's he talking about? Is it possible that what Greer knows that the entities have in mind is transporting humans off of this world and take them somewhere else. Literally, a new world. It would be as new to mankind as the Americas was to the Europeans. Christopher Columbus, um, Hernando Cortez, all of the Spanish and Portuguese explorers that came and examined and researched and mapped out this new world that they found. Okay, and our dollar bill says, you know, he favors the undertaking of a Novus Ordo Seclorum, a new world order. Maybe it's not as much as changing this world. I'm just throwing out a theory here. Not so much changing this world, but changing mankind to live in a new world. That'd be a future video, all right? Now, Greer wrote a book about his past, how he came to form C-SETI, how he developed the close encounter of a fifth kind, which is human initiated contact. In other words, we're not going to wait around to see if we see a UFO come over. We're actually going to be proactive. We're going to meet together. I'm going to guide you into uh, a trance. And in that trance, you're going to make a connection and send out a signal to vector in, it's, that's his language, to vector in these UFOs in order to, for us to make contact with them. Because they have to know that we're on their side. So he writes this book called The Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge. You can download it for free. I think he just gives it away. That's how I got mine from his website. Now here's what he says. That in his young days, I mentioned that he's been in contact with them since he was been in college, training as a doctor. And he says that one day he decided to go bike riding this incredibly long distance. And he had a, a sore on his leg and he didn't pay attention to it. And when he got back home and the next day, he realizes he has this massive infection on his leg. He's poor as dirt. He has no money for a doctor or hospital or anything like that. Can't afford medicines. And he's too sick to get up and too sick to go to class and too sick to walk. And now he's turned septic and he is probably going to die. And just before he actually believes that he's dying, he has what he called a near death experience. Finding myself suddenly released from my body. I was carried out into the depths of space where I already felt at home. Then I experienced what I now understand to be God consciousness. Look at that. Where my individuality became faint as it merged with the effulgent, unbounded, pure, infinite mind. There was no duality. It lasted for what seemed to be an eternity because a normal sense of time disappears in that state of being. I could see all of creation, the vastness of the cosmos, and it was beautiful beyond words. There was nothing frightening about it. Only infinite awareness, joy, and the perception of an endless, perfect creation. Boy, I tell you, what a salesman he is, right? I mean, he's selling this to everybody like, this is the answer right here. I found it. And all you have to do is do what I did and, and make a phone call to E.T. And they're going to show you wonders in the heavens. But you see, Spielberg... I believe was one of the people that God was referring to back in Deuteronomy 13. The one who shows you a sign or a wonder and it comes to pass. And then he says, let us go after other, not another God, which is what I originally thought it was years ago. Other gods, which threw me. And I'm going, aren't they going to worship the Antichrist? Yeah. But what did God say in Exodus chapter 20 where the Ten Commandments are? Thou shalt have no other God before me? No. Thou shalt have no other gods 
before me. And so now it's, it's clear to me. Stephen Greer is sort of like Elijah the prophet, John the Baptist, all rolled into one. He's the one saying, let's prepare the way for the star people to come. Let's partner with them and let's transfigure this entire world. Let's change everybody into the image that they want us to be in. Is that why you think God calls us here in these last days to be part of that? No, not at all. God calls us to stand against it. Now he's going to throw out the word avatar. In fact, let me go back here. He mentions what he called the God consciousness. Now in the New Age terms, they have a phrase called Christ consciousness, which basically means that uh, they believe that there is this all-encompassing spirit that goes all throughout all the heavens and that everybody who hacks into this spirit or links into it is part of the collective. Sound communist to you? It is. They're part of the collective. They're part of being one with everything in the universe. So that now, instead of you being under the authority of God, they say you get to be equal with God. That is not true. That's not, not even in this universe being true. We'll never be equal with God. But that's what the God consciousness that he's talking about is all about. So now he's going to use the word avatar. And he says this, Eventually two brilliant scintillating lights approached out of the stars. I now understood them to be avatars. And you see the definition of the word avatar. Av means down. They're coming down. You remember that verse in Revelation 6, Revelation 12, where we see the stars of heaven falling down? This avatar is a falling one. Okay? And the word tar means to cross over. They've left, Jude said, the angels left their first estate. And they came over here to this world. So eventually two brilliant scintillating lights approached out of the stars. I now understand them to be avatars, manifestations of God. As the avatars approach me, I entered a state of oneness with them. It was incredibly beautiful. Then there was a conveyance of knowledge. Remember what we've been talking about. In a pre-verbal form. In other words, knowledge without words. Before and beyond words. I have no sense of how long this union with God lasted. Stop! He doesn't just say union with the avatars. Union with God. He is united with God. Being then equal with God. But we're not united with God. We're not going to be as wise and smart and old as God is. We're not. He said, I was affected by the beauty of it all, yet very overwhelmed at the same time. And with that, I acknowledge their reality and the very exalted celestial beings that exist and the existence of the Godhead and the oneness of creation and divinity. And that's what I experienced. Complete, perfect oneness of unbounded mind and creation as one. Then I sort of lost consciousness and fell back. Mm, think about that. Into my body, just short of whoosh. The experience of oneness with them had a key message. The conscious mind we are awake with at this moment is the same as that of the divine being and of all beings. Did you hear what he said? He's saying that when you achieve this God consciousness, you will recognize then that you are one with God and that your conscious mind at that moment is the same as God's mind is. I think God has something to say about that. In fact, I read that and immediately this verse came to mind. Isaiah 55, 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, 
neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Stephen Greer says, I was equal with God in my thinking. I could think like God thinks. What did the devil promise Eve? In the day you eat thereof, then you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The devil promised her, and Eve represents the soul of humanity on this earth. The devil promises people that if they will just do what he tells them to do, what he tempts them and draws them into, what he very subtly sneaks into them, if they will just do what he wants them to do, then they will be equal in thought and activity with God. But God says, not a chance. My ways are higher than your ways. As, as high as heaven is above the earth, that's how high my ways are above you. And we don't know where the end of the universe is. Take a look at this. This is a CE5 event. I think this might have taken place in Japan, but I'm not sure. There's always one of uh, Greer's photographers there, someone taking pictures with various cameras. Still cameras, videos, things like that. This is a still camera shot of the people practicing the CE5 protocols. Out of nowhere, what looks like a white light flying serpent flew through the air, went up the back of this person sitting in the chair and notice that its head is resting on the forehead of the person in the chair. Let me give you a close-up of that. You can clearly see the presence of this white light entity, what looks like a spinal cord, and when you look over at the head of it, it's a serpent's head. Mark it down. That's a serpent's head. But not a serpent that you would find under a rock somewhere here on, on planet Earth. This is of a different kind. What the Bible calls fiery serpents or fiery flying serpents. Fire because that's what they're made of. The Bible says that he's made his, his angels ministering spirits a flaming fire. That's what they're made of. A type of spirit world fire that brings the sort of like they are light creatures, like they're made of light. And that's true. Uh, this, this UFO landing and alien creature thing that took place in Brazil last year, where these people ended up shooting, having a shootout with the aliens, and somebody caught a picture of it. Those things were lit up, literally from the inside out, with the, a light so bright you almost couldn't look at it. Greer said in his documentary on this, which is where I got the images from, Greer said that this person actually had what was called a kundalini experience. No, that's not an Italian dish. It is an ancient Hindu practice. It's Eastern religions, people, the, tr the trans transcendental meditation that they do, the chanting that they do, the mantras, the finger, I uh, uh, forgot what they were called, and all about opening up the pineal gland and giving enlightenment to the third eye. What did Satan say? Then your eyes shall be open. Notice this diagram here, the serpent going up the spine. How many bones do you have in your spine? 33. Remember that 33 on the eagle? And when the serpent reaches through the seven chakras and makes it to your pineal gland, right here, you, if you notice people from India, they wear a dot right here on their head. What is that a symbol of? It's, it's a symbol that they have been enlightened that they have received kundalini or they have received, here it is, the word Shakti Pat. Shakti is the female goddess of the 
god group in India, 330 million gods. The Shaktipat is either the, the serpent touching you or an advanced guru touching you on the forehead, giving you instantaneous download of wisdom and knowledge, and now you have had your third eye opened. It's all going according to the book here, people. All according to the book. We have the Andreessen Affair, and I will tell you something. What got me going with all of these aliens and how they're linked in with evil spirits, how they're linked in with demons, devils, and the fact that literally that's what they are. Again, I want to stress to all my Christian brethren out there, my, my, my fellow pastors, I've not fallen off the deep end down, in, you know, down into the lake. I'm not drowning. I'm not going down. I'm not losing my mind. I don't believe Marvin the Martian sitting on the planet Mars trying to get rid of Earth because it blocks his view of Venus. What I'm trying to get across is that this is in the devil's playbook. This is what he has decided he's going to use against the earth, against God's people in the last days. So that makes all of this extraterrestrial stuff, all the talk about uh, alien um, hybridization, uh, alien abductions, uh, craft that can appear in one place and then disappear and appear in another place. They can travel faster than anything that we've ever seen on this earth. That's why you can't shoot them down. I mean, there's just all of these things, all of that, the alien visitations and everything, the people getting in contact with them through what? Meditation? Come on. That's indication of spirit activity. And what got me leaning in that direction was somebody sent me um, a... Um, a package, a computer package. It was a zip file and it had, man, I don't know, probably close to a thousand different books on the UFO topic years ago. And I've still got the, the package. And I've been going through those. And I found one book, very, very intriguing to me. And it was about an American woman by the name of Betty Andreessen. When Betty Andreessen was uh, about 11 or 12 years old, you see the cover of uh, one of the books, The Andreessen Affair, Phase 2. Uh, that's her drawings, by the way. She's a fairly talented artist. But she said that she saw one of these gray aliens while she was out playing next to the woods or a field, and the gray alien touched something on his jacket there and all of a sudden, this little blue orb began flying around her head. And when it got to her forehead, it touched her and went into her forehead right here, which is where your pineal gland is. And when this happened, she fell backward. Now, I'm like you guys. I've seen enough of these people in certain types of churches that believe that you can be slain in the spirit when the Bible says nothing about being slain in the spirit, not one word about being slain in the spirit. Where did they get that from? Do you know masonry acts that out? When a person goes through the blue lodge, the first three levels, when they're going to graduate, they have to go through a little play uh, called the resurrection of Hiram Abiff. And you as the Mason initiate, you're Hiram. And you have the secrets to temple building. And three ruffians are going to try to take it from you, but uh, you don't let them. And so they smite you on the left side of your chest. They smite you in the neck. And then they hit you right here in the head. And you fall backward. And you literally fall backward in the Masonic Lodge. And you have these men with this big canopy or carpet or something like that and they catch you 
just like in some of these churches, and they stand you back up, and now you have died and been reborn in the Masonic Lodge. It's like baptism, right? But it's not baptism of God. So anyway, when I saw this happen to her, I went, oh my goodness, she got slain in the spirit. Well, it turns out Betty Andreessen just happens to be a Pentecostal, been one all of her life. Here is a couple of photos of her during hypnotic regression. Somebody who's trained in hypnosis hypnotized her and went back to get all of these stories of when she was in the uh, UFO, flying to a different world, going into this great chamber, visiting an entity she called the One, but she won't tell anybody what the One looks like or what the One said. And any attempt to try to get her to talk about it, she won't talk about it. But here she's in one of her regressions, and lo and behold, she raises her hand up in the air and starts speaking in an unknown language. What did God say in Deuteronomy 28? A nation of fierce countenance whose tongue thou shalt not understand. They're speaking through her. Yes, this is Pentecostal psychic ability. It's not from God. But she believes it is. She believes the aliens are angels that are on God's side. Well, she's only half right. They're angels, all right, but evil ones. And they're not on God's side. And she has been duped all her life by these entities. So that's what got me thinking that these aliens and these extraterrestrials and these entities far more linked with occult practices than they are science fiction, okay? So this is not science fiction. This is spiritual fact right here. The same thing, I could ask you a question, you think Steven Spielberg is a Pentecostal? No, but after the success of Jaws, Columbia Pictures let him make his Close Encounters of the Third Kind it also has been successful. In fact, it's been more successful over the years than Jaws has. People don't think about seeing, going and seeing Jaws anymore, but people have bought numerous copies of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I have a copy of it. I've watched it probably, I don't know, 30, 40 times maybe. I always find something new every time. And I've studied Spielberg and the, and the way he presents things in his movies. So after this success of those two movies, he finally gets to make another movie that he's been working on called E.T., The Extraterrestrial. And Spielberg, being the good Jew that he is, he doesn't really think highly of Jesus Christ. But he's going to use the theme of Christ. And so E.T. is this God up in the heavens who falls down to the earth, right? Because his ship crashed. And he falls to the earth. And this little boy, Elliot, takes him into his house, and he's eating Reese's Pieces. And, but E.T. cannot live in Earth's atmosphere. He's dying. In fact, he, once he's taken by the military, he does die. But what happens? He gets resurrected from the dead, and he has to go back to his home planet uh, because they're going to come for him. And what does he do there toward the end of the movie? Elliot's standing there crying like a baby. And so E.T., here it is, enlightens his pineal gland and says, I'll be right here. E.T., this lizard, dragon-looking, frog-looking alien, right? Steven Spielberg. So that makes Steven Greer and Spielberg and others Someone who is desperately trying to turn the hearts of mankind all over the world to go after familiar spirits. Leviticus 20, verse 6, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a-whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. That's Stephen Greer up at the top 
that is three what he refers to as star people, they are, to me, they are a type of familiar spirit or maybe an unclean spirit, evil spirits. Uh, they look kind of weird, but that's who Greer says they caught on camera. Me, I'm still like with that serpent going into that person. To me, that's the most condemning evidence because when God sent fiery flying serpents to the Israelites, it wasn't so they can have a party with them or snake meat for supper. They bit and killed thousands of people. And it was all pointing you to the gospel because Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. I love that. I love seeing the pictures and the beauty of typology in the scriptures and the prophecies. But you see, all of this stuff here is linked with the Bible in that the Bible tells you that these practices that Greer and others participate in, uh, you shouldn't do them. In fact, God says, don't do them, period. If you do and turn yourself over to them, I'm going to cut you off from my people. God was pretty serious about it. He's trying to protect his people. Uh, then, not only are they linked with uh, the forbidden practices, I believe doctrinally they are linked in with things in the scripture, such as touching unclean things and so on, or having contact with evil spirits. Paul said, warned about seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And that's what they're here to do. They're here to, to try to convince everybody that they have the plan for man's salvation. But they don't. There's only one gospel. And Paul said in Galatians 1, if anybody brings you any other gospel, let him be accursed. And then there's the prophetic side of it. These stories that we've been seeing in the Bible about Samuel and about uh, Micaiah and others where we've seen unclean spirits or uh, people that have been uh, taken over by devils uh, and all the things that pertain to that, there is, a, there is a prophecy layer to this that what we're seeing in these old Bible stories is actually a, a foreshadowing of things that are going to happen so that when Saul calls for Samuel, the prophet, and Samuel, a familiar spirit, shows up pretending to be Samuel, to me, that's showing us that in the last days, a false prophet, where did the woman say that Samuel and the other gods came from? Out of the earth. In Revelation 13, where does the false prophet come from? Out of the earth. So I think this is prophetic in nature and it answers many of the questions that I've had concerning Bible prophecy and what's going to happen in the last days. Here's what Greer's documentary said about his CE5 events. What we've come to learn is this. We are standing at the precipice of a new age. There's power in the many, but only when they're acting as one. That's when resonance happens, whether joining together as responsible citizenry against the forces standing to divide us, or joining consciousness to unite with beings who are prepared to communicate with us, we must come together as one. Now, let me straighten out a couple of things very quickly. Number one, when Greer said, there's power in the many, but only when they're acting as one. Did you know that Elijah, one man, who the Bible says is of like passions as we, prayed one time by himself and it didn't rain for three and a half years? Do you know that in the showdown with the prophets of Baal that Elijah had, that all of the collected prophets of Baal, like some 400 men, could not, with them cutting their skin and bleeding all over the place and crying and shouting to Baal, their God, they could not get Baal to send fire down from heaven. Elijah, just I guess to show off a little bit, had him go get like 12 barrels of water 
pour water all over the sacrifice, all over the altar, all over the ground, make a trough around it of water. And Elijah prayed one time, and the fire from heaven fell down. It consumed the sacrifice, it consumed the altar, and licked up all the blood that was, or the, all the water that was on the ground. So do we really have to get the majority of people in on this plan or it won't work? No. You see, God is a savior both to those who are part of the overall body of Christ, but he's also savior of just the one person. If my whole family, my mom, my sisters, my wife, children, grandchildren, they all decided one day that they weren't going to serve the Lord anymore. That doesn't mean that I have to follow with them. Or, and it doesn't mean that if I can't get them back to following the Lord, that I'm going to lose my salvation. It doesn't mean that at all. If the stars fall, and they're going to, I'm going to serve God. If no one else will serve God and pray and call unto the Lord, I'll do it. Okay? And then... He talks about joining together, joining consciousness to unite with the beings. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. What concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So here, Greer says, we must all come together as one and join with them. God says, don't. Now, take a look at this. I literally just found this yesterday. I was putting notes together uh, for this video, and I found that Greer has put out a new documentary. I didn't know this one was out. So I... I Put it up on the screen and I'm playing it sort of in the background while I'm working on this presentation here. And Greer is going to take us through him conducting a CE5 event. He's got everybody sitting out in the desert somewhere or on a mountainside or a beach or wherever they are. Get away into the wilderness. That's where in Revelation, or excuse me, Isaiah 13, Isaiah 34, other places like uh, Revelation 18. The wilderness is an area where man isn't. And if you're going to find creatures of the night, you're going to find them out in the wilderness. And so lots of spirits, like in, I mentioned Isaiah 13, they gather in places where the man, Christ Jesus, is not. So think about that just for a minute. Let's say that there is a, a man that lives in a particular place and uh, him and his family, they have forsaken God. They don't have anything to do with God. There is no Bible. They don't read the Bible, don't care about the Bible, nothing about the Bible. In that place, you're going to find spirits there. They're going to be there. Why? Because Jesus isn't there. But you take a family that literally, they're, I mean, they're not fake. They're not hypocrites. They're trying to live right. They pray. They study the scriptures. They uh, love the Lord, they confess their sins, they live a good Christian life. You're going to find Christ there in everything they do, and what you're not going to find is devils shacked up in their house, okay? And so anyway, read Isaiah 13, Isaiah 34, you'll get the gist of what I'm saying. But anyway, so Greer takes him out into this wilderness, and he's conducting this CE5 event. And he goes through the different stages, and now he's going to recite a mantra, and don't try to, if you watch this documentary, don't try to figure out the words. I don't know what they are. But he's doing this mantra. And what he's doing, he's enchanting. And I mentioned this in the last video that I did on sightings. Does the devil or devils have the power to take an inanimate object? Let's use the pen here. Turn Take an inanimate object, a non-living object, and turn it into something that has life. Yes. And how did Pharaoh's magicians turn their rods into serpents? The Bible says they used enchantments. 
You remember in Ezekiel 1, the wheels that were by the chariot of God? And that the spirit of the living creature, the angels, was in the wheel? That basically made the wheel alive because the spirit was in the wheels. Okay? So, Greer has got these people. They're all meditating. They've all emptied their mind. He's done the mantra. Now, this is what happens. Greer leads a CE5 team by chanting a mantra for them to repeat three times. He tells them to visualize two triangles, one pointing up, one pointing down, then for them to cause it to turn to a tetrahedron by chanting the mantra. The resulting symbol is what Greer calls a Merkaba. He calls it Merkaba. I call it Merkaba. Tomato, tomato, potato, potato. What is a Merkaba? See, I've known this about Greer for quite a while. It blows me away. According to the Wikipedia article, Merkaba, which is the Hebrew word for chariot, think about it, refers to the throne of God described in Ezekiel 1, which is said to be a four-wheeled chariot driven by four living creatures. Each of these creatures has four wings with the four faces of a man, lion, ox, and eagle. Students of Jewish mysticism have focused on these passages from Ezekiel, seeking to understand their deeper meaning. So, uh, the videos that I've done in the past on what UFOs are, they've all said what I absolutely believe. In Ezekiel 1, we're given the blueprint for one of God's chariots. And the Bible says in the book of Psalms that the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. So the Bible's telling you that the chariot of God is an angel itself. It is a living entity. It's living because it is made up of angels. Okay, I, this, I love this. I mean, if God's going to ride in a ride, right, it's not going to be a Yugo or a Pinto or oh man, a Gremlin. Remember those? He's going to ride in a chariot that is alive. And that's how the wheels get to be alive. Okay? So that's what Merkaba means. So here's the guy, Stephen Greer, who tells everybody to chant a mantra and visualize two triangles, one pointing up, one pointing down, as above, so below. And he says, when this turns into a tetrahedron, a three-sided pyramid on both of them, now you have a Merkaba, a chariot. So he's practicing Merkaba mysticism. He's calling for a Merkaba to show up. And lo and behold, what shows up? Merkabas, spirits in the form of chariots. And the vehicles that they're riding in are just as alive as the entities that are riding in them. You don't believe that? Second Kings chapter 2. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. The chariot of fire was angels. Notice this, 2 Kings chapter 6. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And that's when Elisha told his servant, they that be with us are more than they that be against us. He's referring to the chariots and the horses. You still don't believe me? Turn to Zechariah chapter 6 in your Bible and read it. The first chariot were red horses, and in the second chariot black horses, and the third chariot white horses, and the fourth chariot grizzled and bay horses. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. Three witnesses enough? I mean, that third one there in Zechariah pretty much nails it, right? That you have a, a chariot and a horse, and the angel says, These are spirits. They are God's angels that are His chariots. Now, if you want to have some fun, go study in the Bible, King James, I prefer, 
and look at all the places where you'll find the word chariot or chariots. You'll have a ball studying this. Go get our free software, purebiblesearch.com. Download it for Windows, Linux, or Mac, free of charge, and there's no spyware on it. And you can search for the word chariot or chariots, and I tell you it's better than watching science fiction movies or whatever you like to watch, okay? But anyway, so here's the king of all New Age practitioners on the earth. He's got a huge following all over the world. He's calling for chariots to come down out of heaven, and they show up. Video, there's video evidence of it. Not just that, that spirit snake going into that person. I mean, there's videos of him doing a CE5 and, and two uh, amber orbs appear over the ocean right in time for everything. And they just sit there. And everybody goes, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. And they curse a lot. Then, I'm not done, Greer... I couldn't believe it when I heard it. Again, I'm working on my notes for today, and he says this, and I went, I literally did that. So after they've called the Merkaba, here's what happens next. As we rest our consciousness all together in it, we see it creates a zone of peace and safety. Are you kidding me? Listen, he used those exact words. I didn't change them. He said, peace and safety. I have suspected. This is from 1 Thessalonians 5. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Everybody's wanting to know, who is, it, who is the they that's going to say peace and safety? I've suspected for about the last year or so that it would be them. And so far, I'm not wrong. Greer said it. He said, our own astral vehicle that we can center our awareness within and travel throughout the cosmos and throughout other dimensions. So what I'm saying about Greer is what he believes. He believes that you call these Merkabas down and then you can get a ride metaphysically with them and go anywhere you want to. Now you've gotten into the chariot with them. I'm telling you, I think this stuff is prophetic. Not pathetic, well it is pathetic, but prophetic. So, Leviticus 19 tells us don't get in the chariot. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Now, I just want to say this, and I'm going to try to be as PG as I can, that I, the word defilement here, I believe, is the right word. Not just annoyed by them, not just um, getting to believe some of the things they say, but literally defiled in ways that we understand how the word defilement is used. A woman who is assaulted would say that she has been defiled by her attacker. Okay, I'm just trying not to say certain words, all right? But I believe that's part of it. Absolutely believe that's part of it. There is an alien hybridization program and I probably don't have time today to talk about it we're almost done but there is a hybridization program going on and more than one person Whitley Strieber Whitley Strieber said that the alien entity that adorns the front cover of his first book on aliens communion is a female alien of which he has had several instances of fornication with this particular entity in that case, that makes it, what is it, a uh, succubus, a type of spirit that defiles a man. An incubus is a type of spirit that defiles a woman, and so on. Now, also, 
Greer is interviewing several of the people that were part of this CE5 event. And the name of the video is called Contact the CE5 Experience, if you want to look it up. Just don't believe what they're saying on there. Please don't turn away from the living God, okay? This guy says, it was the first time I saw an ET in my entire life with my physical eyes. On my left side, on the third night, an orb coming up from underneath the ground. And it's just hovering nice and slow. As I got closer, I could feel just a love, a sense of oneness with them. It was so powerful, and then it slowly went back into the ground. Listen. Number one, it came up out of the ground. What does that mean? Well, you remember when Saul wanted a familiar spirit in the form of Samuel, and the woman called for it and shrieked in terror, and Saul said, what did you see? And she said, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And this guy, who I don't think has ever read the Bible, described perfectly where the aliens he saw come from. He saw gods coming up out of the earth too, just like Saul did. Just like in Revelation chapter 13, where John saw another beast rise up out of the earth. This was the false, what? False prophet. What was Samuel? A prophet. But that's not the real Samuel. That's a false Samuel, a false prophet rising up out of the earth. Do you see it? The prophecies in Revelation 13, verse 11, the typology that shows you what the prophecy is going to look like is in the Old Testament, telling you literally a familiar spirit coming up out of the earth. That's where the aliens, and the, the, there's more than one person that's ever talked this way about seeing aliens or different ghost entities rising up out of the ground or out of the earth. Now, I'm going to leave you with one more thought on this. And that is, what is their purpose? What are they driving at? What do they want? Why are they coming down here and doing all the things that they're doing. Why, why earth? And why at this time? You know, we live in a time right now where we understand more of the mysteries of the universe, the mysteries of life on this planet more than any of our forefathers combined. We understand for the first time what is, what, what, what is happening when a new baby enters into this world, whether it's a human baby or any, any species of living creature, a cell that divides and becomes a new cell, a tree that drops a seed, the seed becomes a sapling, the sapling becomes another tree which drops another seed on the ground, and so on. Animals that procreate and then they create uh, their own children and those children grow up and procreate and create their own children and us, part of that mix, we're doing what God said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And so we understand more about DNA than any other generation before. So when I read Psalm 139 verse 16, where it says, in thy book, all my members were written, I understand what that book is. It's the book of DNA. And so we understand about DNA. We understand about uh, the processes of how children are, you know, are conceived and come into this world. And so anytime I see seed mentioned in the Bible, I understand that it refers to your offspring. You know, his, the seed of the serpent shall serve the seed of the woman and so on. Um, that refers to Christ, their children, uh, the Antichrist, child of the devil, children of Belial, uh, the Bible calls them and so on. But also seed represents DNA. Everything that lives has DNA. And one of the things that we know happened before the flood was that there was an event that took place whereby these gods living up in the heaven came down to the earth, took human wives, went in unto them and created 
children unto them. The same became mighty men of old, men of renown. These were the giants of the days before Noah. And the Bible says in Genesis 6, 4, that uh, also after that, after the flood, this event happened again. Angels descended down on earth. They left their first estate, jo, jo, uh, Jude said. And they came down and they went in unto women and they mingled their seed in with the seed of humankind. And it created this hybrid race, this chimera, as it were, of these giants. We have Og, we have Ar in the Bible. We have Anak and the sons of Anak. We have Saf. Uh, we have Goliath, who was part of a brotherhood of, of uh, five brethren that were all giants. We have the stories of giant skeletons being found in different places throughout this country back in the 1800s. We have stories literally all around the world that include man's interaction with these giants. And these giants literally were a hybridized form of human being mixed with, you can call it alien, you can call it uh, demon, you can call it evil spirits, unclean spirits, seducing spirits, you can call them whatever you want to. But that's what happened. And is that that thing prophesied to happen again? I believe it is. Let me read a channeled message that came from uh, the Pleiades. That's actually a constellation that's mentioned in the scriptures. So this person, the, the lady's name is Barbara Marciniak. She wrote a book called The Bringers of the Dawn. And she records for us what this particular channeler received as a download from one of these quote-unquote entities. The entity said, it is not just that we, the Pleiadians, have come to assist. We are only one grouping from one star system. There are many who have journeyed here for many reasons. The majority of the extraterrestrials are here for your upliftment, though there are also those who are here for other reasons. Where will this transition take you? We would like to see you become qualified to form worlds consciously. You are preparing to seed and be the species planted on many new worlds as they are being formulated. And because you have stored within your memories the history of what has occurred here on earth, you will be able to teach others and consciously hold the direction in which other worlds need to go. Again, Bringers of the Dawn, page 10 and 11. What is she saying? She's saying what others, including Dr. John Mack, who was, as I mentioned earlier, the head of the psychiatric department at Harvard University, they tried to fire him over this. But as he interviews and does a regression on all these patients that come to see him, he finds one thing in common. Practically every one of them, if they were a woman, they had their egg extracted from them. If they were a man, they had seed extracted from them. Even Betty and Barney Hill, one of the first abductees that made their story publicly known back in the 1960s. Later it came out. Barney was very embarrassed about this. He didn't want anybody to know about it. But after he passed away, it became knowledge that that's exactly what they took from him and his wife. And when people have questioned, what, why are you doing this to me? The resulting answer that they get from the entities is that we are trying to help your species or we're trying to help your species and at the same time save our species. But it all has to do with them taking of their seed, mixing it some way with ours. And we live in an age right now where that is not a preposterous idea anymore, is it? A hundred years ago, you couldn't get a giraffe and a hippopotamus mated together. But you can now. Okay? It's just a matter of who wants to do it. And how would you feed a 15,000 pound giraffe? I don't know. Anyway. But it's also recorded in Bible prophecy. Nebuchadnezzar the king had a dream. He woke up, he could not remember the dream. 
He calls on his astrologers and soothsayers and Chaldeans and says, tell me the dream. And they said, we can't do that. We don't know your dreams. He said, tell me the dream. I'll have you all killed tomorrow morning. Daniel went with his three friends. They prayed all night. God gave him the answer. Daniel goes back to Nebuchadnezzar and says, I can tell you what it means and what it says. So the breakdown of the four kingdoms, the kingdom of gold, which was Nebuchadnezzar, the kingdom of brass, which was, I think, the Grecian Empire, kingdom of iron, the Roman Empire, Empire. but then we have, uh, well, no, we have gold, silver, brass, then iron. And not just any iron, iron mixed with miry clay. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron and his feet, part of iron and part of clay. And the interpretation is, and whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, here it is, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Sound preposterous? Read 1 Corinthians 15 and ask yourself the question, there are two different types of bodies, Paul said, a terrestrial body and a celestial body. And then he said something strange. He said, to every seed his own body, meaning if it has a body, a living body, then it has seed. Whether terrestrial seed or celestial seed, it has it. And so the combining of those two seeds is something God just will not have, but it's going to happen. God's going to allow it because it's going to bring down the judgment of these evil angels and it will bring down the wrath of God upon the angels and upon the humans who let themselves be mingled with them to become gods. There's only one way to become immortal. Only one way to seek eternal, everlasting life. There is only going to be one, one perfect world, and it will not be brought down by devils. It will come down in the form of New Jerusalem. And the Savior of New Jerusalem is Jesus Christ. And the people who populate New Jerusalem are those who have called upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And in that day, Mankind will be able to see the face of God. I'd like for you to be there. I'd like for myself to be there. That's why I call on the name of the Lord. Would you do also? I hope you've enjoyed this series. I've got some more information. I'll share it. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.